Well, good evening. Good evening. It's good to see everybody tonight. Let's uh, begin our service. We'll stand and sing, I Stand Amazed in the Presence. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. For me, it was in the garden. He prayed, not my will, but thine. He had no tears for his own griefs, but sweat drops of blood for mine. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. He took my sins and my sorrows, he made them his very own. He bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. When with the ransomed in glory, his face I at last shall see. Twill be my joy through the ages to sing of his love for me. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous. How wonderful is my Savior's love for me. You may be seated as we continue to sing. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified. Knowing not it was for me, he died on Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. That my burden so found liberty at Calvary. By God's word at last my sin I learned. Then I trembled at the law I'd spurned. Till my guilty soul imploring turned to Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. That my burden so found liberty at Calvary. Now I've given to Jesus everything. Now I gladly own him as my king. Now my raptured soul can only sing of Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. That my burden so found liberty at Calvary. Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. 
Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. There are things as we travel this earth shifting sand that transcend all the reason of man. But the things that matter the most in this world, they can never be held in our hand. I believe in a hill called Mount Calvary. I'll believe whatever the cost. And when time has surrendered and earth is no more, I'll still cling to that old rugged cross. I believe that the Christ who was slain on that cross has the power to change lives today. For he changed me completely, a new life is mine. That is why by the cross I will stay. I believe in a hill called Mount Calvary. I believe whatever the cost. And when time has surrendered and earth is no more, I'll still cling to the old rugged cross. Amen. Let's pray for our offering. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for the cross. We thank you for the sacrifice that you made to come and live as a human being to face the same trials and temptations that we do, live a perfect life, Go to the cross, die, and be resurrected. Lord, we just pray that you will never let us forget what you have done for us. Lord, just pray that this offering will help us to further your kingdom here on earth. It's in your name we pray. Amen.
Well, tonight we continue our message from last Sunday night. We begin to look at the subject of the downward slide of spiritual lapse in David's life. And we have in 1 Samuel chapter 27, 29, and 30, the lowest point in David's life up to this point. And we begin to see him lapse spiritually. And we said last week that we all come to places in our Christian life sometime when we begin to slip and struggle to please God. And it's a process that takes place. And we were looking at David and how he began to falter in his spiritual life. And I want to review, kind of remind us of some truth that we looked at last week. We talked about that great moments of victory are great moments of danger. David had experienced some great victories in his life up to this point. He had spared Saul twice. He had kept back himself from killing Nabal. And he had no doubt gained great respect from all his men. But that can also, when we have great victory, it can begin, pride can begin to creep up in our lives. And on the mountaintop, the wind blows a little swifter and the storms can rise a little faster. And so we begin to look at these steps that David took. And first we said we begin to conceptualize the situation. Chapter 27, verse 1. David began to think wrong. And that's where spiritual decline always begins. It begins in the mind. You begin to think sinfully. You begin to conceptualize the situation. The second step was we begin to cooperate with the enemy. In verse 2, David became friends with the enemy, the king of the Philistines. And we saw that this is how we begin spiritual lapse. We begin to let down our guard and we become friendly with the world, with the flesh, with the devil. And then number three, we become a contagious influence to others. Verse three, we talked about how David did not just sin alone. Uh, It didn't just affect him. It affected 600 men and their families and David's own family. And when you choose to become carnal and sinful and slip spiritually in your life, it affects your family your wife, your children, your friends, your church. You become a contagious influence in a negative sense. And that leads to the next step downward, and we see it very clearly in David's life. We begin to experience a counterfeit peace. Now remember, this is a process. Don't forget that. You don't just wake up one day and you have slipped into spiritual lapse. No, you begin to think, think wrong, sinfully, and then you become friendly with the enemy. And then you begin to compromise, and then you influence others, and then you have this counterfeit peace. Now Saul had stopped following David while he was living in enemy land, and David was saying, hey, I'm finally safe here. Saul's not dogging my every move, hunting me day and night. The pressure's off. What a relief. But what David was experiencing was a counterfeit peace. And we talked about how that sin has its temporary pleasures. Disobedience has its exhilarating moments. The devil will have you believe that it pays to submit to your flesh. To surrender to the ways of the world. Proverbs says, stolen water is sweet. There is a certain thrill in sin. And there's a certain thrill in living a disobedient life. But we have to remember John 10.10. The Bible says, the thief does not come except to steal, kill, and destroy. 2 Corinthians 11.14 It says, and no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself as an angel of light. Now, listen, there are times when we relax and we enjoy our disobedience. 
You know why? Because they're enjoyable. But they are passing. They're short-lived. And listen to me. They never, never, never bring satisfaction. you got to know that. Sin will take you farther than you want to go. Keep you longer than you want to stay. Cost you more than you're willing to play. pay. The world and all of its pleasures, all of the money and the fame and the securities, they're empty. They bring no peace. They bring no satisfaction. We are reviewing from last week. All of the sex, the drugs, the money, the entertainment, the pleasure in this world cannot fill our lives with contentment. It gives us a counterfeit peace. Now the devil, he would have you believe that living for yourself and following your own way is the way to live. But it leads to misery and disappointment. We're going to see a little later where it led David. Now, Let's think about this. How many professing believers are living empty with no peace? How many believers are drinking at broken wells of dirty water when they could be drinking from the living water? Now, David was a believer. Don't forget that. He had a heart for God, but he lapsed spiritually. David had settled for a counterfeit peace. The pressure was off. We talked about how it takes work to live for Jesus. You have to grow, and sometimes that's hard. And change doesn't come easy for us sometimes. It's tough to be growing because we develop lifestyles and sinful habits. that, And we don't solve problems God's way. Listen to me. Being God's kind of person. Being God's kind of husband. God's kind of wife, God's kind of parent, God's kind of friend. It takes work, effort to be that kind of person that's going to please God. Accountability is uncomfortable. I mean, how many people are saved, know the Lord, but they're living in a counterfeit peace? And I thought a lot about that because I believe there's a lot of believers out there. They're believers. But you see, the enemy is a distorter of the Scripture. The devil will twist the Scripture. He'll distort it. He'll explain it away. And our flesh is just like that. When it comes to truth that is presented from God's Word, and when we need to grow and God challenges us through His Word, we ignore it. We explain it away. We don't want to hear it. We developed our own opinions about the Scripture. And we would, yeah, that's what you believe. But that's not what I believe. And we try to rationalize. And we try to, instead of rightly dividing the word of truth and applying it in our lives, how many people are living in chaotic homes? Let's be honest. And they think, well, this is as good as it gets. They say, well, this is just my lot in life. They're living a counterfeit peace. How many people are caught up in some sinful habit and just kind of resolve, well, that's just the way they are. Their dad was that way. Grandpa was that way. I'm that way. They're living with a counterfeit peace. They believe the Christian life is one where we just struggle along, limp along down here on earth. It's tough. It's rough. It's misery. Yeah, there's moments of joy and peace, but mostly it's just dreary, dark. There's so many people who are believers who think that's the best life can be. Trying to fill the emptiness and struggles with all kinds of things. It's if they're just waiting for the day when we get to go to heaven and experience real peace and real joy. They're living a counterfeit peace. And can I say that if that is you, then you are in the downward slide of spiritual lapse. But it doesn't have to be that way. Can I t- say this? You don't have to wait to get to heaven to experience joy and peace. You can experience it right here and right now in your life. We can have victory. We are more than conquerors, the Bible says. We have a sufficient Bible, a sufficient Savior. 
the person of the Holy Spirit who lives in each one of us, who can use the Scripture to mold us and shape us and change us into the image of Christ. We can have godly homes. There can be godly husbands and wives, godly parents. You can handle conflict in a biblical way. You can deal with sin. You can deal with evil and handle guilt and grow in love and forgiveness. You can learn to communicate. You can find answers in the Word of God. <clears throat> we have great hope. Don't be deceived by the devil. I think a lot of people are deceived. The devil's got them duped. Don't be deceived by the enemy. Don't let your flesh lead you away. Don't listen to the world. And all of it's garbage. Are you living a counterfeit peace? If you are, I can tell you how you got there. You begin to conceptualize the situation. You became sinful in your thinking. You begin to cooperate with the enemy. You begin to believe his lies. You begin to lower your standard from the biblical one. And now you're living in a counterfeit peace. And you may be there for quite a while. I think about David. <clears throat> he lived in the enemy camp for 16 months. That's a long time. I tell you what, there's peace from living in a right relationship with God. To be growing, to be putting off the old man, putting on the new. That, what genuine peace that brings. Real peace, not a counterfeit peace, but a genuine peace. You say, well, is there pressure? Yes. Does it get tough sometimes? Yes. But the joy of having real peace, and that peace comes from obeying God. Have you decided, well, it's just too hard, David. It's too hard to grow and change and to be accountable. Are you opting for your own plan in life? Are you in a state of spiritual decline in lapse? Well, that's kind of a review from what we looked at last week and just some admonition. That brings us to another point in this decline, and this is number five on your outline, if you notice. We become a counterfeit people. Once we have that counterfeit peace, we become a counterfeit people. Now look in your Bibles at 1 Samuel 27, verse 8 through verse 12. Verse 8, And David and his men went up and raided the Gerizites, the Gerizites and the Amalekites, for those nations were the inhabitants of the land from old, as you go to Shur, even as far as the land of Egypt. Whenever David attacked the land, he left neither man nor woman alive, but took away the sheep, the oxen, the donkeys, the camels, and the apparel, and returned and came to Achish. Then Achish would say, where have you made your raid today? And David would say, against the southern area of Judah, or against the southern area of the Jeremiahites, or against the southern area of the Kenites. David would save neither man nor woman alive to bring news to Gath, saying, lest they should inform on us, saying, thus David did. And thus was his behavior all the time he dwelt in the country of the Philistines. So Achish believed David, saying, He has made his people Israel utterly abhor him. Therefore, he will be my servant forever. So here David is living with the enemy. The pressure is on, off. And guess what? David becomes a hypocrite. A hypocrite. He was pretending to be one thing while he is entirely, really, something else. Deep inside David, he's an Israelite. He'll always be an Israelite, but he's trying to make the Philistines think that he's on their side. And that's what happens when you're in a state of spiritual lapse. Lapse and carnality. You become hypocritical. Inside you, you are a believer. But on the outside, you want to be like the rest of the world. Now in verse 8, there are many, there's three nations mentioned. And those three names that are mentioned in verse 8 
are all enemies of Israel. But they were not enemies of the Philistines. Now that's interesting. So here David is living in the land of the Philistines. And he would go out and fight the enemies of Israel. They weren't the enemies of the Philistines. They were the enemies of Israel. And when he would go in and invade, he would kill everyone there. Now, I'm telling you, he'd go in there and he'd kill the women, the men, the children. I mean, he'd slaughter them all. Why? Well, verse 11. Apparently, David was accountable to Achish for his actions. And then he returned to the city. You know what the king would have asked him? He'd say, well, where have you been? And verse 11 says, David would save neither man nor woman alive to bring the news to Gath, saying, lest they should inform on us. You know why he killed everybody? He didn't want anybody tattling on him and telling what he was really doing. And he would go back and he would point to the king. He would say, where have you been? What would you raid today? And David's answer would be very vague. He said, I've been in South Judah fighting. He didn't tell him he was killing the people of Judah who were Israelites. He was killing the Israelites' enemies. But he didn't tell the king that. Then David says he had been killing the Jeremelites and the Kenite, Kenites, verse 10. You know what that is in verse 10 when he said that? It's an outright lie. He had done no such thing. And when you live a life of hypocrisy, you're always living in secret. You're always covering up. You don't want to be accountable. You don't want anybody asking you any questions. So you're vague. You cover up. That's why David would kill everybody in the cities he raided. You know why? Because he didn't want the truth to come out. He didn't want the truth to come out. Spiritual lapse and decline leads to a life of hypocrisy. The Bible has a lot to say about hypocrisy. Look at a couple of verses. Isaiah 29, 15. Woe to those who seek deep to hide their counsel far from the Lord, and their works are in the dark. They say, who sees us and who knows us? That's hypocrisy. Romans 2, 17-24. Indeed, you are called a Jew and rest on the law and make your boast in God and know His will and approve the things that are excellent, being instructed out of the law. And are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, having the form of knowledge and truth in the law. Verse 21, you therefore who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? You who say do not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You have a poor idol, do you rob temples? You who make your boast in the law. Do you dishonor God through breaking the law? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, as it is written. That's hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. 2 Timothy 3, 5. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power, and from such people turn away. That's hypocrisy. Is that us? A form of godliness? Who are you today? Who are you? This is application. This is where we need to examine ourselves. Are you real? Are you something fake? Are you living a lie in your life? Are you like David appearing to be one thing, but being totally something else? You say with your lips you love the Lord, but your heart's far away. Can I ask you this? Who are you in the dark? How about you young people? Where are you? No one knows about it. There may be somebody and what you're doing in your life, nobody knows about you. Your wife don't know, your husband don't know, your children don't know, your parents don't know, nobody at church has a clue. But you know. You know. And you know what? You're living a lie. You're living a lie. You let on like you're okay spiritually, but you're not. You're a hypocrite. And you know what? The Lord knows you. He knows you. He knows where you are. He knows whether or not we're real or not. 
You may be just like those in the text we've read. You're seeking to hide your life from the Lord. Your works are in the dark. No one knows. You may be teaching others not to do certain things, but you yourself are doing them. Is that you? Man, I think of through the years that even men of God who stand in pulpits and preach, thus saith the Lord, but yet they were living a lie. They were living a lie. They were telling people not to do certain things that they were doing themselves. Hypocrisy. Are you in a state of spiritual lapse? Well, you begin to conceptualize the situation. You begin to cooperate with the enemy. You became a contagious influence. You begin to experience a counterfeit peace. Then you become a counterfeit person. But notice number six. You begin to experience the consequences. Let's read... Chapter 29 of 1 Samuel. And notice, say on your outline, you lose your identity. You lose your identity. Let's just read. There's 11 verses here. Then the Philistines gathered together all their armies at Aphek, and the Israelites encamped by a fountain which is in Jezreel. And the lords of the Philistines passed in review by hundreds and by thousands, but David and his men passed in review at the rear with Achish. Then the prince of the Philistines said, What are the, these Hebrews doing here? And Achish said to the princes of the Philistines, Is this not David, the servant of Saul, king of Israel, who has been with me these days or even these years? And to this day I found no fault in him since he defected to me. But the princes of the Philistines were angry with him, so the princes of the Philistines said to him, Make this fellow return, that he may go back to the place which you have appointed for him, and do not let him go down with us to battle, lest in the battle he become our adversary. For with what could he reconcile himself to his master, if not with the head of these men? Is this not David, of whom they sang to one another and dance, saying, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his ten thousand. Then Achish called David and said to him, Surely as the Lord lives, you have been upright, and your going outs and your coming ins with me, and the army is good in my sight. For to this day I have not found evil in you since the day of your coming to me. Nevertheless, the Lord do not favor you. Therefore return now and go in peace, that you may not displease the Lord of the Philistines. So David said to Achish, But what have I done? And to this day, what have you found in your servant as long as I have been with you, that I may go and fight against the enemies of my lord the king? Then Achish answered and said to David, I know that you are as good in my sight as an angel of God. Nevertheless, the princes of the Philistines have said, He shall not go up with us to the battle. Now therefore, rise early in the morning with your master's servants, who have come with you, and as soon as you are up early in the morning and have light, depart. So David and his men arose early to depart in the morning to return to the land of the Philistines, and the Philistines went up to Jezreel. So here we read that the king, <coughs> Achish, is getting flack from the Philistine people. They want to know why David and his men and all their households are in their midst. I mean, they're saying, why in the world is all these Israelites living down in Ziklag? I mean, these people were their sworn enemies. Don't forget, David is the one who killed their great warrior, Goliath. Remember? David slew Goliath. <clears throat> and here in the chapter, Achish defends David. He said, oh, no, no, everything's okay. David's on our side. He's our guy. But the people said, we don't trust him. We don't want him down here. So Achish has to confront him with the fact that they can no longer tolerate him around. So he tells him to return and go in peace. And what does David say? He goes, what have I done? What have I done to deserve this? David becomes a man without a country. He becomes a displaced person. You know what he had done? Listen to me. He had lost his identity. Who am I? What is my mission? What is going on in my life? Who has my true allegiance? 
Tough questions, no answers. What David is facing here is a real identity crisis. He is a displaced person. He's not a Philistine. He's not an Israelite. He's a displaced person. And that is the way it is with a Christian who has went into spiritual lapse. I want you to think about this. He don't feel comfortable with the people of God and the things of God, but he don't feel comfortable in the world and with the world's crowd. Is that not what we see in this text? I mean, with David, he's not comfortable with the Philistines. He's not comfortable with his own people. You lose your identity. You know what David's done? He's lost the joy of his salvation. He was slipping lower and lower and lower in spiritual decline. The few benefits of carnality is ellipsed by, eclipsed by the many liabilities. You know, when somebody first walks away from the Lord and the things of God, there might be a little pleasure in that. It might even be free and it might even be delightful. I've heard people who have left churches and they go, Oh, I'm so glad to be done with that. The relief. Pleasurable. But after a while, the bill comes due. You've got to pay. And it's when you start paying the price for sin... When you become confused and all that sin seems to be, comes up real empty and you realize. Notice B, you descend into deep depression. So not only did David lose his identity, but he descends into deep depression. Look at chapter 30 now, verse 1 through 4. Now it happened when David and his men came to Ziglag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziglag attacked, and Ziglag attacked Ziglag and burned it with fire, and had taken captive the women and those who were there. For small to great, they did not kill anyone, but carried them away and went their way. So David and his men came to the city, and there it was, burned with fire, and their wives, their sons, and their daughters had been taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more power to weep. Now put, you, put yourself in David's shoes. He's left the Philistines. He comes up over the hill on horseback and there before him in the distance is the city where he and his men had lived for the past year and a half. An entire place is burnt, slapped down to the ground. And worse than that was the personal cost. All of their wives and children have been taken captive by the Amalekites. Now, just think about this. All their homes and possessions are gone. Their wives and children are enemies. This is the same people that David had raided earlier. Well, what did they do? Well, they wept. They wept until they didn't have any more tears. That's what the Bible said. I mean, have you ever been there? Have you ever wept so much that you wept that you just couldn't weep no more? Look at what happened next in verse 6. Here we go. Payment for sin is coming due. Now, David was greatly distressed. For the people spoke of stoning him because the soul of all the people was grieved. Every man for his sons and his daughters. Let's stop there. The very people who looked to David as a guide and a friend and as a leader now turned away, embittered at the results. The guys he had trained in the cave. These guys are now grumbling. We don't trust David anymore. Think for a minute the consequences that came from the first step that David took downward when he started thinking sinfully. Remember, go, go back to 27.1. Here it is. 
And David said in his heart, Now I shall perish someday by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than I should speedily escape to the land of the Philistines, and Saul will despair of me to seek me any more in any part of Israel, so I shall escape out of his hand. There it is. Where had that wrong thinking led him? Friendly with the enemy, influenced all those people, living a false peace, living a false person, lose his identity, all his family and his men's family are taken captive by the enemy. And now David is in a deep, deep depression. That's what the verse said. Verse 6, now David was greatly distressed. You tell me sin doesn't have a high price to pay. You need to learn from this example in Scripture. Sin never pays what it promises. Listen to me. You make light of the Word of God. You make light of the preaching of the Word of God. You make light of the church. You make light of accountability and pay with play with sin and make a joke out of the Christian life. I guarantee you. I guarantee you, you'll wake up one day and your life will be a mess. It'll be a mess. Most people's lives are a wreck all because they're living life their own way. Look around. Depression is the result of not handling life in a biblical way. And you know what people do? They turn to drugs. They turn to alcohol. They can't handle life. They can't handle the pressures of life. So you know what they do? They reach for a bottle and drink it and try to forget it. They take pills and take drugs. Try to escape the pain. Sinful living brings about depression and even physical problems stem from it. Look at where David is at and has been for a year and a half. The enemy don't want him. His own troops want to stone him. I mean, can you imagine? His own guys are thinking about stoning him. The king of Israel wants him dead. His family's been taken captive. His house has been burnt to the ground. I think that's a truckload of problems. Wouldn't you say? I mean, that's a lot. You talk about stress. You talk about pressure. You talk about being down. Why? Because David didn't obey God. He didn't do his will. He followed his way, his own path, his own thoughts. And look at where it got him. Listen to me. Don't miss this. If we get anything out of this at all, it ought to be this. The consequences of sin is great great if you're thinking about contemplating something sinful beware look at David's life don't do it well I want to close tonight with some hope and I want to encourage you I want to share with you what to do when you get in a state of spiritual lapse and how David got out of this mess and we read it I mean, notice sit number seven on your outline, the climb out of spiritual lapse. All of these problems, what did David do? Well, go back to verse six, the latter part of the verse. We didn't read it, but here it is. Verse six, now David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his son and his daughters. But, notice what it says. David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. It doesn't say, well, David met with a psychologist. It didn't say he got in bed and quit seeing everybody. David did not say there is no hope, I'm too far gone. Things are too big a mess. And take his own life. He was far down the ladder in despair I believe when you look at David and you really read and think about this, he was at the bottom rung, man. He was down pretty low at this point in his life. He's at a place where you either jump off into oblivion or 
you cry out to God. And that's what David did. It said, and David encouraged himself in the Lord. The wonderful thing is that as a believer, we have a choice. We have great hope. David turned to the Lord and listened. He can do what no one can do. Amen? When you reach up, He's there. You on the bottom? For the first time in one and a half years, David looks up and you know what he says? Oh God, help me. <laughs> That's a pretty good prayer, isn't it? Oh God, help me. And God does. The Bible says that He is a very present help in time of need. David started to change his thinking, and that's what you need to do in dark days. Get your thinking right. Get your vision, instead of horizontal, get it vertical. Look to the Lord. You see, God is a sovereign God, and He allows us to get in some pretty deep messes. You know why? You know what? Sometimes I think we're trying to get people out of a bunch of messes that God's got them right there for a reason. I mean, sometimes I think with our children, we might be trying to get them out of some mess they're in, and you know what? God's got them right there for a reason. We don't need to get them out of the mess. We need to let them waller in it, and we need to get them to cry out to God. Maybe you're here tonight and you've known the joys of walking with Christ. But in a moment in your life, you opted for the wrong fork in the road. Now you're in a tailspin, spiritually speaking. Life's a mess. You're saved. You just moved away from God. Well, you know what? God's always where He's always been. You've always heard the story about the guy in the pickup truck, and he's sitting there, and his wife's on the other side, and she said, Honey, I just don't know why we don't sit close together anymore. And he said, Well, I've never moved. I'm driving. I'm right here where I've always been. But isn't that the way it is sometimes? God doesn't change. God's always the same. He loves you. And God's a restoring God. God's a God of hope. God's a God of help. And He is right there. If you'll just turn to Him, if you'll cast yourself upon Him. David, you're displaced. Your life's a wreck. Stress is great. Depression is sitting in. It's eating away like some disease. Reach up, David. <laughs> the Father is waiting. The door is open. You say, how do you get out of spiritual laps, David? I'll tell you how. You encourage yourself in the Lord. That's how you do it. You say, well, how do you do that? Well, the sufficient scripture. You learn the word of God. You renew your mind. You put off sinful habits. Put on godly habits. Listen, there is a God. He is great. He is holy. He is just. He's all-knowing. He's all-powerful. He's everywhere present. And there is a Savior. And He has come and lived and died to set us free from sin and to give us new life and new purpose. There is a Holy Spirit who indwells you, who leads you into all truth, who convicts you of your sin, who comforts you in your life. There is a Bible. It is pure and right and totally sufficient for everything we need in life. That's how you encourage yourself in the Lord. And it's not a quick fix. It's not a zap. It's not like a snap of the fingers. But if you commit to change, it takes work. You've got to exercise yourself unto godliness. You've got to work out your own salvation. You need to get in Sunday school. You need to get in church. You need to get faithful. You need to start reading your Bible and praying and communicating with God. Let God communicate with you. That's how you encourage yourself in the Lord. You've got to work. Now David didn't stay in his spiritual laps. He finally came out. 
when you turn to, to the Lord and obey, you know what? Listen to me. There's blessing in obedience. Look at chapter 30, verse 7 through 9. Look at what the Bible said. Then David said to Abathar the priest, Amalek's son, please bring the ephod here to me. And Abathar brought the ephod to David. So David inquired of the Lord, saying, now here we go. He's, he's talking to the Lord now. Shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered, Pursue, for you shall surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. So David went, he and 600 men who were with him, and came to the brook Besser, where those stayed who were left behind. Now jump down to verse 16. 30, 16. And when he had brought him down, they, there they were, spread out over all the land, eating and drinking and dancing because of all the great spoil which they had taken from the land of the Philistines and from the land of Judah. Then, verse 17, David attacked them from twilight until the evening of the next day. Not a man of them escaped except 400 young men who rode on camels and fled. So David recovered all, all that the Amalekites had carried away and David rescued his two wives, and nothing of theirs was lacking, either small or great, sons or daughters, spoil or anything which they had taken from them. David recovered all. What a blessing. Now when we obey God and we seek Him, guess what happens? The Lord blesses. That's what we see here. Well, we've looked at these downward slide of spiritual lapse. And here's a question as we conclude. Are there, are there any of these characteristics true in your life? It all begins with wrong thinking. Are you cooperating with the enemy, worldly, fleshly, moving closer to sin? Are you influencing people in the wrong way with your sinful living? Are you living a counterfeit peace? Are you a counterfeit person living in hypocrisy? There's a high price to pay for sin. You know what happens? You lose your identity. Depression. But there's hope. You encourage yourself in the Lord. You may be here. You might be listening. You're lost without Christ. You don't know Him. You've not repented. You've not believed. Your life's a mess. There's no joy. There's no peace. You're searching. There's an empty place in your life. Can I tell you tonight? Jesus is the only one that can fill that void. Jesus. He can change you. He can give you new life. You've got to turn from your sin and by faith trust the Lord Jesus. May God help us to follow David's example. To learn from this example. That we might not fall into spiritual lapse in our life. Let's pray tonight. Father... Thank you so much for your word. I pray that you would help us to really contemplate and think about this story in the life of David and how low he had got and how down he was. But Lord, help us to encourage ourselves in the Lord, to look to you for strength and guidance and help. And Lord, I just pray that you would help us to learn from this example and may we follow you and obey you and lord we know when we do <clears throat> there's blessing we pray this in jesus name amen